Um, but I, I do want to thank you. Uh, it's a, a real privilege uh, to speak to you uh, on the eve of the 20th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And it's, it's particularly wonderful to be here in Kansas City, which um, is, is such an appropriate setting uh, because it was just a couple blocks from this building at uh, Kemper Arena, as many of you remember, that Ronald Reagan gave a speech uh, 33 years ago that in many ways, I think, helped catapult him uh, to the White House. As you recall, Reagan had just conceded defeat to Gerald Ford at the Republican National Convention. And uh, there may be even some people in the room today who remember that Ford then summoned Reagan down from the skybox to address uh, the, the delegates on the floor. Reagan initially said uh, he didn't want to come down. He said it was it's someone else's night. But eventually, the, uh, the ovation um, uh, brought him down to the floor. And he spoke for six minutes uh, entirely impromptu without notes. Um, and what he said captivated the room and much of the nation that night. He conjured uh, an imagined future uh, at one point, and he talked about what it would be like to open a time capsule uh, in 100 years. And I actually discuss this speech because I, I find it so remarkable. Uh, in, in my book, I, I mention it a little bit. Um, and Reagan said, we live in a world in which the great powers have poison aimed at each other, nuclear weapons that can, in a matter of minutes, destroy virtually the civilized world we live in. He wondered if the people opening that time capsule would look back and say, thank God for those people who headed off the loss of freedom, who kept us now 100 years free, and who kept our world from nuclear destruction. Now, when he finished speaking, one delegate summed up Reagan's performance to a reporter for Time magazine with what I think, to this day, is the single best description of Reagan's talent for communication. Uh, the man said, Ronald Reagan could get a standing ovation in a graveyard. Now, had it not been for that speech in Kansas City that night, um, which really helped Reagan salvage a losing campaign, um, there might not have been a Reagan campaign in 1980, there might not have been a Reagan presidency, uh, and there might not have been a, a tear down this wall speech, which uh, is the subject of my book and uh, my remarks here tonight. Uh, what I want to do tonight is uh, briefly, uh, if I can, talk about some of the factors uh, that contributed to the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War, which I think stand today as the high watermarks of US foreign policy in the second half of the 20th century. So uh, I'm going to sketch out a little bit um, uh, some background of the speech, uh, the context in, it was, in which it was given. I want to explain why uh, Reagan's speech was such a pivotal event. Um, and then I'd like to suggest some ways in which the end of the Cold War has relevance to the challenges uh, that face us today. Uh, before I begin, I do want to uh, just uh, make a couple points of personal privilege. I'm from New York, and um, as a New Yorker, I've developed a, a thick skin. And last night, I was in Houston, and I told um, the audience that um, if at any point I heard booing uh, during my speech, I would just assume that meant the Yankees were winning. Um, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I don't have that excuse tonight, um, but uh, I hope you'll bear with me. Um, uh, the second thing I wanted to say is that um, in, in this book and in my remarks, I really try to be as thorough as possible. Um, but I'm quite certain, as all authors are, that there are details I will have overlooked or missed or simply got wrong. Um, in my job at Time, I work with uh, a lot of different writers every day. And over the years, I found that the best ones are those who never quite uh, feel satisfied with their stories. They believe they could have done more or read more or made one more phone call or turned up one more undiscovered fact. Now, I really admire that attitude uh, and ethic. But um, as President Reagan himself uh, liked to say, uh, they say hard work never killed anybody. But I figure, uh, why take the chance? Uh, so on, on balance, I'm, I'm more sympathetic to that view, I think. So uh, again, uh, please uh, forgive uh, anything that I may miss during this speech. Now, I do bring up that famous uh, joke of President Reagan's, because I think it speaks to one of the themes that I, I want to get to uh, in these remarks. Uh, to this day, uh, as many of you know, on both the right and the left, uh, Ronald Reagan is often reduced to a kind of dueling caricature. Conservatives remember him as the tough-talking fighter who conquered big government, stared down the Soviet Union, and won the Cold War. Uh, and many liberals remember him as an amiable dunce, in Clark Clifford's uh, infamous phrase, uh, who blew a hole in the deficit and was manipulated by his advisors, if not his astrologers. Um, I, now, there is some basis in reality for both of these caricatures. But as I try to show in this book, I believe both are also incomplete, inaccurate, and misleading. 
During his presidency, Reagan was far more adaptable, politically shrewd, and open to compromise than either his champions or his critics prefer to admit. He believed, particularly after he survived an assassination attempt against him in 1981, that he had a special mission to spread freedom and fight oppression. But he sought to do that not through the use of force, but through dialogue, diplomacy, and persuasion. And it is those qualities, I think, that are the key to explaining both what Reagan was trying to accomplish with his famous speech in Berlin and why he ultimately succeeded in helping to end the Cold War. Um, before discussing the tear down this wall speech itself and the background um, of Reagan's visit to Berlin, uh, I want to just raise and try to dispel or challenge three myths or, or misconceptions that have arisen over the years about the end of the Cold War. Um, the first is, myth is the notion that the end of the US-Soviet superpower rivalry was not a particularly momentous occasion and did not, on balance, make the world a safer place. The thinking goes, according to this view, that the consequences of a nuclear war between the US and the Soviet Union were so great that neither side would ever initiate one. And according to this view, the Cold War was actually a period of relative global stability, a, a long peace, as some historians have actually termed it. Now, I think this view is misguided for a few reasons. For one thing, we now know that there were actually a number of occasions when the two sides actually did reach the brink of a direct military confrontation, either because of deliberate provocations or, uh, more often, uh, unintended misunderstandings. In many parts of the world, the Cold War, of course, was anything but cold. Hundreds of thousands of people died in proxy conflicts waged by the United States and the Soviets all around the world. More than 100,000 US troops died in wars against communist enemies in Korea and Vietnam, 10 times the number than have died in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I think it's inarguable that the end of the Cold War actually did make the world a more prosperous place, especially for those living behind the Iron Curtain. In today's Financial Times, uh, I noticed an article on uh, what life has been like for, for the countries of the Warsaw Pact since the fall of communism. Uh, and the story said that living standards have risen 50% in the last 20 years, and life expectancy has increased an average of four full years since the fall of communism in those uh, former communist countries. From 1989 to 2009, the number of democracies in the world nearly doubled, and the number of people living in poverty has been cut in half. And to be sure, the United States still faces threats from terrorism and nuclear proliferation, but the fact that there are no longer thousands of Soviet nuclear warheads pointed at American cities means, in my view, that the United States is more secure today than it was in the 45 years of the Cold War. Now, the second myth uh, I want to uh, challenge is the idea that the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union was inevitable. Now, according to this view, the contradictions at the heart of the socialist system meant it was doomed to fail no matter what. The collapse of communism was overdetermined, as economists like to say. But uh, as the historian Archie Brown writes in his new study of the history of co communism, Prolonged economic failure does not, by itself, lead to the downfall of authoritarian regimes. By the middle of the 1980s, the Soviet economy was certainly in bad shape and uh, uh, was, was actually in desperate need of, of reform, but it was nowhere near as dire as in the days after World War II when that country had to rebuild from the ruins of a conflict that killed two, 20 million of its citizens. The Soviet-backed governments behind the Iron Curtain lack popular legitimacy, it's true, but there are many examples in the world today of authoritarian regimes that managed to hold on to power under similar circumstances in places like Cuba, Iran, Burma, and North Korea. It's probably safe to say that communism would have collapsed eventually, but it was by no means inevitable that it would collapse when it did, or that the toppling of one communist regime after another in 1989 would unfold as peacefully as it did. And this leads me to the third misconception or myth that I'd like to challenge, and that is the idea that Ronald Reagan won the Cold War. Now, this is a view that has taken hold since Reagan left office, and it's grown even more popular since his death in 2004. And the week of his funeral, for instance, The Economist magazine ran a cover of Reagan under the heading, The Man Who Beat Communism. 